Well, he had a stroke when he was, see the dates are all wrong. So what most people don't understand about Mike was somehow he lied about his age at some, started lying about his age at some point. I watched him on the back nine. I didn't know it at the time it was him, but it couldn't have been anybody else. 1982 U.S. Senior Open. It's one of the first times they, they didn't play, you know, it was called the National Senior Open. The USGA only started running the U.S. Senior Open in the late 70s, I believe. That was where Mike set his driving record, 515 yards. So he played in it every year. He was the oldest guy in the field by 10 years. He's close to 70 years old. And Remember the TV back in those days? It only, they only covered about holes 14 through 18. And there was only about two cameras, right? You had two, basically the last two groups. But they, used, they were cutting away to Mike for every shot he hit because it was so crazy what he was doing. He was back in the pack at even par. The leaders were eight or 10 under par. He was back in 30th or 40th. But they'd cut away and Mike was, you'd say, this is the oldest guy in the field, but he's hitting at 60 or 70 yards past all the divots in the fairway. He's splitting the fairway on every hole, like you dropped it, perfect distance from either rough, 60 yards past the groups of the last divots. You know, you'd have all the divots where the whole field would be landing. He's 60 yards past it. Every hole on the back nine, he hit it inside 10 feet, and that includes the par fives and two, every hole. And then he would never even sniff the cup on his birdie or his eagle putt. How could that be? He, he was so sad. So you remember um, there, there was a, a British announcer back in the day named Peter Alice. Sure. Remember him? Yeah, no, I remember Peter him. Alice was the tower commentator and he says, boy, this, he's just such a brute of a man. But when he goes to putt, I just want to go down there and hug him. I feel so bad that he keeps hitting it eight feet, six feet, eight feet for eagle and three putts. He would just jab at it. He, he just had no sense of confidence, no sense of rhythm. Yeah, he got hypnotized once. And that week, he damn near won the... Um, it was, I believe, the, the, uh, the Long Beach Open, back when the Long Beach Open was pr prestigious, equivalent to a PGA Tour event. Well, he had a stroke when he was, see, the dates are all wrong. So what most people don't understand about Mike was somehow he lied about his age at some, started lying about his age at some point. And, and, and people, it's, it's so funny, people don't even want to believe me. They're so enamored with Mike Austin and believe every little thing that he said that they believe a lot of his lies he had a lot of lies i not only do i have a copy of his birth certificate but the 1930 and the 1940 census and again i confirm it confirmed that where mike was living and his age and it's right there in handwriting in his handwriting Mike Austin, 1940, age 25. So he was born in 1915, which means when he died in 2005 in the motion picture home in Woodland Hills, he died there at age 90, not 95, which means his record drive, which was supposedly done at age 64 in 1974, he was actually 59. So none of his records seem as crazy when you take the five years away. But that's the truth. He was born not in Guernsey, like he claims. That's a, that's a Channel Islands. There's sure, sure. Jersey and Guernsey off the, in the Channel Islands. I had a terminal there. Okay. He wasn't born there, fortunately. He was born in Alabama, where both of his parents end up be, ended up being buried because that's where they were from. They returned them home to Alabama, but he lived his first 25 years, uh, roughly, in Fulton County, you know, in Atlanta, in a very hard scrabble, blue collar neighborhood in Atlanta. Where did he pick up golf? 
It's a good question. So we're pretty sure that his older brother and his dad taught him that they were pretty good players, that they could, despite Mike's prodigious length, he could never beat them. It's unknown where they played or how, how often because this is a family in the height of the depression where Mike was making min the equivalent of minimum wage at age 25. His brother was making, you know, if 10, let's say 10 bucks an hour is the minimum wage now. Mike was making 10 bucks an hour. His brother was probably making 15 to 18 bucks an hour. So his, not a lot. The dad was retired, but he was making, he had made, you know, he's a furniture maker is what it says in the census. Mike was, might have been the equivalent of a, uh, the guy who fills the, the soft drink machines and has around, you know, making minimum wage filling soft drink, something like that. It's hard to know. But um, that's what they did. They all lived under one roof. With his, he lived with his brother and his brother's wife and the ki his, his Joe's kid, you know, those kids and the dad and the mom. They all lived in one house together and um, apparently the dad and the brother were decent golfers I, I don't have any other details other than that that they could be, no he just his his ne um, his nephew talked about it a lot so his nephew so his brother Joseph Mike had a brother named Joseph or Joe and his his son was Joe jr. or Joe the third maybe Joe but his nephew came out and he had a lot of Mike's stuff. He had Mike's poetry book. He had his journals, stuff like that. Sometime in 1941 is when he started heading out here. So, or 1940. So it was sometime right after that census was taken. Whatever month they did the census, I'm guessing spring or summer, Mike left soon after that uh, via Chicago. He met up with Count Yogi. That's where Mike got the idea for having a big indoor driving range and sports teaching center, which he set up in Culver City uh, a year or two later. So Mike journeyed out here. I'm not sure how, but he through Chicago, he stopped and there's, we, we have the approximate date, spring of 1941 or so, that somewhere around there. We don't have the exact date, but we have photos of him with Count Yogi in Chicago. Count Yogi, by some accounts, it's, it's, it's really hard without corroborating sources, but Count Yogi could have been one of the greatest scoring golfers of all time.